We're live. We're live. Great. Welcome aboard, everybody. And I'm really glad we're having this opportunity to share a clear, clean space. This comes out of uh, David Grove's work. And I find it very compelling to uh, share it with you, especially Marco, um, because I'm very interested in the visionary, as are you, and we're, uh, we've been discussing this a lot. And we're also reading um, Schlotterdijk together and his work on spheres. So I hope at the end of this uh, session, we could explore a little bit about um, um, the work that we're going to do here today and the different models that we've been playing around with. Um, so let's go right into the experiential part. Uh, first of all, is there anything you need to ask me about this process before we begin? I don't think so. I think that we've covered a couple of the basics. I have my sticky notes right here. I have a pen right here. And you can see my space, uh, my room. Uh, and perhaps just to describe it, it's a separate structure from the house. Inside my house, I live with my family, my wife and two daughters and our, our dog. And so it is a kind of bubble that I've created here. Uh, the windows are open. I can hear a helicopter flying overhead. And uh, you may hear a, a train passing by occasionally uh, about a block away. Uh, so that's where I'm at. Uh, and uh, well, I'm curious to see where we go together. Yeah, this is a real interesting experiment for me um, because we're doing this online, which is very different from, you know, being in the same room together in real time. So um, I'm going to just offer this up as an experiment for both of us, and then we can uh, figure it out as we go along. Um, there is a structure to it, and of course we might use other things. We've already explored uh, clean language and symbolic modeling uh, in a previous uh, call. And um, what, the way I'd like to begin is with a clean start, okay? And maybe we'll find an outcome for it. For this session to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? It will be like clearing. Like clearing. Be, mm -hmm. And when this session is like clearing, you will be like what? I will be spacious. Spacious. And when you are like spacious, is there anything else about spacious? There is a flow through the heart. Flow through the heart. Space flows through the heart. Space flows through the heart. And when space flows through the heart, whereabouts in the heart? All about. All about. And is this a good time for us to, is this a good place for us to pause? Sure. Okay. Um, and when spacious space flows through the heart and all about, what would you like to have happen? I would like for things to grow in that space. Ah. And you would like for things to grow in that space. And I'm going to pause and invite you to consider that this is an outcome. Hmm. And you could jot that down, perhaps on the post-it. However, however way you want to language it. Or you could draw a picture if you prefer. Okay. Let me write, write down just keywords. With some, some doodles or something like that to Great. add a visual dynamism to, to the note. So I'm going to write down space. I'm going to write down grow. And I'm going to write down things. And so we have space, grow, things. Great. Now, this is where we're, go we're going now into clean space. Uh, 
place that space row things. Place that. It's on a post-it, right? Here it place is. It, okay. Place it where it needs to be. Hmm. Okay. In the, in the space you're in. Well, I'm going to put it right here. You won't be able to see it. It's right down on my computer screen at the very bottom of it. It's not blocking the screen at all. Okay. It's hanging kind of, kind of from the bottom of it. Okay. And actually, it's upside down because I wrote on the, on the wrong side of where the sticky part is. Okay. Now, place that. You've placed it where it needs to be. I'm just organizing my notes here. Space, row, thing. Now place yourself where you need to be in relation to it. <laughs> and let me know when you when you when you're there. I think I'm here. And are you in the right place? If you can hear me well, then I think I'm in the right place. I can hear you fine. And is your outcome in the right place, space growth thing? I think my outcome depends upon time. And when it depends upon time, is it in the right place? I think so, yes. You think so? Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. And are you in the right place? I think I might get to like to get a little bit closer if, as we continue talking. That is and to say closer to the screen, closer to your image in front of me. And is, are you... Or is it at the right height? Is it being meaning the sticky note? Space growth thing. Space growth thing. The sticky note. Is it at the right height? Yes. And are you at the right height? I think so. <laughs> I'm not I'm not exactly sure. I might, I might need to just adjust. Please. There, there's something almost about posture that we're exploring uh, and being seated, being seated in space with a posture, with various forces and pressures upon the body. Is that where you want to be? I think there is another place to... What, how... I think I'm good right here. Is it at the right angle, the outcome, space growth thing? That's a good question. I'm not sure that I've really thought about or felt what its angle really could be or is. Is that the right angle for you to be? In relationship to the outcome. I think it is. I think I could explore what that means just it by feeling into it. By as we... feeling into it. Mm-hmm. And is that the right amount of space between you and it? These are very good questions, actually, because I f I f I'm reflecting on them or I'm experiencing them on multiple levels. I'm experiencing it on them in relation to this piece of paper 
sticking to my computer screen. But at the same time, that piece of paper is pointing to, or the words are pointing to something bigger, more general, something existential, something uh, with association, fl flickering associations uh, to other aspects of, of my reality that uh, I'm seeing in relationship to the spatiality of our encounter right now. Multiple levels and existential and bigger and space growth thing. Mm -hmm. Now I have a, I'm going to pause for a second, make a little a comment here because this is a challenge for me. This uh, exercise, is really about your relationship to your own outcome. It isn't about your relationship to me. Okay, so I would uh, appreciate that you can relax about you know having a regular conversation or a dialogue with me, because we're actually doing something much more like a ritual, and this is an invitation for you to to explore your own experience of your own space. Mm -hmm. So it's a fractal idea here that there are pat the pattern of the whole repeats itself mm -hmm. in each of the parts. Mm -hmm. part. So we're going to look at um, finding a space that knows about this desired outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll, we'll take it from there. It's an improvisation. Mm -hmm. uh, so find a space that knows about space grow thing. Find a space that knows about space grow thing. And move to that space. I'm getting a little bit closer to all this clutter on the sofa behind me. And what do you know from that space there about space growth thing? This is a big pile of things that I would say in some way are part of a soil or part of a substrate or part of the part of the space they're part of this space but they also um all contain things that might grow within uh this space and within that larger fractal kind of space that is contained here and at the same time is containing uh, this one and is there anything else you know from there about it, the outcome. Well, these can't stay here. <laughs> They're going to have to be um, cleared, organized, worked through, thought through, read, discarded, um, put away. Uh, there's some processing that I think needs to occur with all this stuff. And and I'm just, I guess, waiting to get to it. Of course, it's here, but I haven't really gotten to it. And cleared, organized process. And what could this space be called? It's a workspace, partly. It's um, a creative space. A workspace, a creative space? Yes, it's an ex exploratory space. Exploratory space. And can you label that on the post-it? Sure. Okay, don't, no, 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 no. Stay in that, keep your chair in that space. Okay. I want you to find that, okay, we're, we're locating. This is your, uh, we're finding, 
remember we talked about location, space, place. Yes. Exploring this. So that space. Yes. In that space, you know about that other space behind you. Yes. And it, it needs to be cleared, organized, and processed. Yes. And you know that from that space, a workspace, creative space, exploratory space. So label that on the post-it and put the put it where put it there on that space. So we're labeling that space. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Work, exploratory creative exploratory space. That's your label, yes. Okay. One label. Okay. One label? Yes. Just one label, as many words on it as you want, but just label it as you please on that post-it. Okay. Work. Or whatever you want to call it. It's, just, it's for you. Exploratory. I, I want to capture what I actually say, because I don't know what I'm going to say in the next moment, necessarily. Why? Right. You forget. Exploratory. Exploratory. Okay. I'm going to, I'm assuming I, I can remove these later and that I will remove these later, but well, can now, you? Well, where the space you are now. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm probably not being very clean here. Okay. Uh, but the space you're sitting in right now is where yeah. you know that from. Yes. Put the label on that. On You're sitting in a chair. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Let's try it this way. Put it there. Okay. Okay. And now move to another space that knows about space grow thing. I'm gonna move right here. Sure, you can move your chair if you like, but as long as you've marked that spot with that label, so you know where that is. If you wanna move your chair and put it on the ground, or if you wanna walk around. There we go. Okay, so now it's, it's on the floor. Right. Right this there. Is, and, and, and I feel like I need to be right around here. Okay. And this is the space that knows about space growth thing. Yes. It's somewhere in between these two zones. Okay. See, this is my, my computer is over here. This is my interface. That is my, my love seat. And I sit. Th I will sit there and read. I have a meditation cushion on the floor over here. I have a weight bench over here. So there is, there are physical sort of zones in the space. And being here, I'm sort of. I'm not actually in a particular zone because I'm not even facing. I'm not directly facing the interface. Nor am I seated. I would never uh, sit here normally. I would either be here or there. So now I'm sort of in between. It's almost triangulated. Okay. And what do you know? from that space there about space growth thing. There is a transit between these two, these two zones. There's a, I can imagine a, 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 lem, a lemniscate, a, a, a sort of flow, uh, ingress and egress, input, output, or, or, or a, even a sort of wind. There's, a, there's a, an air quality to it, a spirit quality to it. A wind. A wind. A, a, a wind. spirit quality. Yes. Numinous. Numinous. And did you say lim liminous gate? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced that well, though, or correctly. I, I, uh, and pr and uh, transit between. Yes. And is there anything else you know from there about space, grow, thing? That it's important for me to spend time there. It's important for me to... Um, enter into and engage the work creative exploratory dimensions and i don't know if work was exactly the right that that really applied to those to some of the papers and kinds of things the actual space that was just behind where i was located a few moments ago with the chair back there where there's a sticky on the floor i would say is more of the exploratory space if i really was pointing back there to that corner particularly uh, where I have a little, little table, a light. It's an exploratory space. Uh, it's a space where I read and it's a space where I write in longhand on, on, in my notebook. And it's important to spend time there. There's a regenerative cycling quality that I think flows and transits to this interfacial dimension that 
uh, that we're engaging in right now and that I'm present with when I'm sort of flowing into the world. And what, is there any, um, no, what would you call this space? This space? Yes, the turn this, right, the turn right. right now. I would call it an apex. A apex? An apex. Uh, I would actually, let me qualify that, uh, a horizontal apex. Horizontal apex. Right. Could you yeah. write that down? I will. Label it. Horizontal apex. Okay. And just like we did with the first location, the first space. No, no. Yeah, that's right. Okay, putting it on the floor. Great. You're putting on the floor. And move to another space that knows about space growth thing. And what does that space know about space growth thing? The space knows silence, torso, feet. Silence, torso, feet. And is there anything else you know from that space? There? Symmetry. Symmetry. And is there anything else you know from there about space growth thing? Closeness. Closeness. And silence, torso, feet, symmetry, closeness. And what would you call this space? I would call this togetherness. Togetherness. Thank you. Now, I would invite you to move back into space, the first space, which we called uh, workspace, creative, exploratory space. Mm -hmm. And you've labeled it. Wait, wait, wait. Did you label this? I'm sorry. I'm trying no. to keep it. So, let's... could you put it on a post it and mark your spot there? Yes. I'm going to just give it one word. Okay, and you pulled it togetherness. And that's the word. Okay. And I'm going to put it put it right right here down there like on the desk. Mm -hmm. Sort of aligned with my navel. Aligned with your navel? Great. Together. Yes. Move to space one, the first space we explored, which was called the workspace, the creative exploratory space. Okay. And what do you know now from this space about space growth thing? What I know is that I have to move between spaces. You have to move between spaces? Yes. I have to move intelligently between spaces, I would say. You have to move intelligently between spaces. Intelligently and responsively. Intelligently and responsively between spaces. And is there anything else you know from that space about space growth thing? I have to be careful about getting stuck in particular spaces. You have to be careful about getting stuck. Yes. 
in other particular spaces? In particular spaces, get, getting kind of almost like a little whirlpool or a, a um, sort of vortex uh, effect, a kind of cap- capture that a space can have on, on one's, one's energy flow. A, a whirlpool? An energy flow? Vortex. A vortex? Yes. Great. Now move into horizontal apex. And and what do you know now from that space about space growth thing? I know that I'm capable of moving intelligently and responsibly between spaces. And you're capable of moving intelligently between spaces and responsibly between spaces. Yes. And is there anything else about capable? When it has something to do with breath. Breath? And it has something to do with verticality. Breath and verticality. And is there anything else you know there from that space, horizontal apex, about space growth thing? It's useful to be in this space, the horizontal apex space, to see the relationship between the other spaces. And it's useful to see relationships between other spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you to step back into the third space, togetherness. Move into that one. Yes, thank you. And and what do you know now from that space about space growth thing? Togetherness has a Reciprocal quality. Reciprocal quality? Mm -hmm. And is there anything else you know from that space? It it has a cyclical quality as well. So there's a a cyclical reciprocity, I I might say. And it's also multiplicitous. So there's a multiplicitous cyclical reciprocity in Um, space of togetherness. A multiplicity? Reciprocity? Multiplicitous cyclical reciprocity. Multiplicitous cyclical reciprocity. Yes. That's a good Thank one. You. Thank you. <laughs> and is there anything else you know I, about, about your desired outcome, space growth thing? I know that it can also have the quality of to use a metaphor, a roller coaster. A roller coaster. Thank you. (laughs) And now, move to a space that knows about all of those spaces. I'm not sure you can see me here. That's okay. I can see you. As long as I can hear you. And what do you know from there? I know about about the space growth thing. I I know that it's all cool. It's all cool? It's all cool. And is there anything else you know from there? (laughs) I think from here, I... I know that that a beer on a summer afternoon is a refreshing and delightful experience when it's all cool. And a beer on a summer afternoon is a refreshing experience. Refreshing and delightful. Refreshing and delightful. And is that a good place for us to, to pause? I think so, yes. Okay, 
thank you very much. Wow. Okay. So, um, so why don't we move into this? Is the we finished the process? Um, so now we can. Um, you can give me some feedback. I can give you some feedback. We can go into conversation or, or, or more dialogue. Okay. Um, about this process, and but before we do that, I'm going to. We're moving. We talked about um, des desired outcomes. We also talked about action plans. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about how do we move towards an emergent, um, emerging knowledge action plan. Um, and I wanted to explore this with you. What I would invite you to do, this is sort of a homework assignment, or you can do part of it now as well. And knowing what you know now, what is one thing that you will do? <laughs> Maybe not today, but one okay. afternoon I will have that beer. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. When, when you'll have that beer. And where are you going to have that beer? That Outside, afternoon. for sure. Outside somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully with, around some trees. Around some trees. And, and when will you have that beer? Hopefully this summer. This summer? Yeah. And with someone, if someone, if you're going to have it with someone, whom will that be? I'm not sure. Whomever, really. Whomever, whomever, whomever would want to join me and feel, uh, feel liberated okay. uh, enough to, to enjoy that beer. Well, thank you very much, Marco. This is really uh, an exploration for me as well as for you, I'm sure. Because um, I'm, I'm really, um, I'll give you, tell you about my interest in all this because, um, you know, we're moving out of the grid. We talk a lot about the grid metaphor, you know, where everything is sort of fixed and stable and we have the up and the down and the left and the right and the communist or capitalist, you know, it's all pretty fixed. And we're moving towards something else. Some people are, I think we're calling it a network sort of culture um, where, you know, it's not fixed or stable. And those traditional oppositions um, just don't fit anymore. So we're moving in, I think, to more, more and more vibrant uh, networks. Mm. So I think this is a very useful tool, clean space, for working with those who may be in the grid and want to get out of the grid, mm -hmm. work more with networks or the, or the network metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that my interest in working with groups is to facilitate that transition or mm -hmm. if you made the transition and you're flourishing in, in the, a network culture and it's been what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and I found myself at a certain time in my life, maybe 30 years ago, I was getting these visionary episodes, some of which I've shared, um, some of which I've, I've not shared, but they they all had this quality of, you know, uh, you got to get out of this sort of grid mm -hmm. and you're moving towards something that could not, necessarily be specified um and i think that's part of the challenge and now i look back um 30 years ago back in the 80s and i look at um all the diff different things i tried and experimented with who i hung out with the action plans that were formulated the mm -hmm. things that worked out the things that didn't even the things that didn't work out i learned a great deal from now i have a different relationship uh and i believe that what my frustration was that we were in a sort of grid like therapy world Mm -hmm. And but the problems that people are were having were not grid like at all. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're uh, we have much more experience working with uh, networks, and we can also see that there may be new ways of uh, abusing people with networks as well. Mm -hmm. So that's my big research question here. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I can solidify a few questions that I have because I'm really interested in qualitative research. That's mm -hmm. my project. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in doing therapy. I'm not interested in coaching. Uh, and I think a lot of people who are doing clean language and, uh, and clean space um, are definitely in those therapy worlds mm -hmm. or coaching worlds. Yes. Although it can be used definitely for education and other purposes and for business. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in, in research. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I'm moving with this, just to let you know. Yeah. And I have a, a couple of questions and I'm very uh, pleased and delighted to have this opportunity to ask you about this mm -hmm. because I think you have a, some experience that I find very interesting, compelling, and 
overlaps a lot with my own experience. Mm -hmm. So you're a perfect, you're a very good person for me to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. So I I have your permission. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And then then I can ask you some questions about the questions I've asked. Um, Is there a relationship between this clean space process Mm -hmm. did and Gebser's at perspectival. Mm-hmm. This isn't a pop quiz or anything. I'm just asking this question to. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought, you know, Gebser came to mind. Uh huh. Particularly when we returned to conversational mode, uh-huh. when I came out of the exercise and we sat down, and you cued me that we'd be reflecting upon uh, the the experience that I had just had with your instructions. And in particular, uh, his reflections on spatiality and on the way in which the mental constructs a grid uh, and imposes it or superimposes it upon a spatial experience as such. And by virtue of, of that grid is able to manipulate things, is able to organize things in space. And so we don't, because it's so subtle or because it's so prior to our reflective um, engagement, uh, we don't think about it. We don't notice the way in which our experience is structured by the mental's grid upon our innate spatiality. And what what I felt through that exercise is that there were physiological and neurological aspects and in, and felt aspects. That is to say, the, a, a feeling of my experience and a feeling of myself in space through my nervous system and through the way that it responds to its positioning. Uh, that for the most part is, I won't say unconscious, but pre-reflective. I just use the space. I, 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 I haven't thought about it or I hadn't researched it uh, f- with the aid of a, um, I guess, with, with the aid of the kind of exercise that we just did where you really just had me do things. You had me move around and reconfigure that that grid, right? That, that kind of presupposed grid. Um, and to return to that um, desired outcome, the space grow thing, I realized through the exercise that the way that uh, I move through space and the way that I I guess, tie it together. I'm struggling a little, a little bit for words there. But that has a effect or impact or it shapes that, the, the quality of that outcome. It has some, some influence on how that outcome comes forth. So with respect to Ge- Gebser, I, I, I think that part of what, we were doing and part of the multidimensionality that we, we had sort of like that you invoked because, and that I slipped into, I, I didn't quite even feel that I, I was aware, not, not, I wasn't unaware of it, but I wasn't quite, you know, ready for the way in which meaning kind of refracted between different planes. Um, to have that sensibility and a sensitivity to the subtle qualities of, what's actually at, what's going on when I'm in one space versus another space and how I move through those spaces. It made the space itself constitutive, I would say, in a way that I think from the mental or in the way that the mental st- structure of consciousness, as Gibson describes it, constructs reality, um, was more, would be more fluid. Uh, and would be more embodied, uh, I would say. It, more fluid and more embodied than yes. that mental, 
Yes. And, and remember, there was that heart space. That was an aspect to it as well. I, part of how I moved or where I felt drawn as I moved around the space had something to do with where the heart would be open in a certain, in a certain way. I just want to share with you, I may have mentioned this already, but when I was in, uh, in France, in Rouen, I was in a cafe, and I knew somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd re- I'd, I remember reading about uh, Joan of Arc. Mm. She was burned at the stake in mm. Rouen. That's where her trial happened. That's where she was uh, executed. And I walked out of this cafe, and I just kept walking straight ahead, I don't know how many feet it was. Um, it must have been less than a minute. Mm-hmm. And I stopped, and there was this little patch of lavender flowers mm-hmm. and, a, and a plaque that said that's where she had uh, been burned at the stake. Mm-hmm. She's a patron saint of France or something like that. But I just felt this, and I got goosebumps, you know, that, that kind of connection to the field mm-hmm. uh, and the relationship to the field. Um, and I'm just offering that because I think we have these kind of subtle experiences a lot. But like you say, that mental grid tends to delete, distort, generalize them out of our, our uh, operations. And I, I'm very fascinated about um, my experience of studying Gebser with you guys and how um, we can uh, review these different stages. And I did find it, uh, reading Gebser so daunting. It made it feel like, oh, this is way over my head mm-hmm. but i'm wondering about that mm-hmm. i'm wondering if maybe what he was calling the apperspectival 50 50 60 odd years ago when he wrote that we may not be maybe we're already activating that but we don't label it as mm-hmm. apperspectival mm-hmm. we're calling it a twirl or maybe some people are calling it the emergent mm-hmm. i think emergent is actually better than apperspectival or the interval this is my opinion mm-hmm. uh, but i but uh, you know i don't care what it's called mm-hmm. <laughs> as long as it happens yeah. <laughs> So thank you for, for dialoguing with me on this because, uh, and I also wanted to ask about the same question about slaughter duck. Is this clean, this clean process that we've been doing, that we did today, is there a relationship between this clean process and what slaughter duck is up to or what, uh, you know, integral theory is up to or what the theory of everybody is up to? Mm-hmm. I'm just wanting to put this into, into dialogue with you as we've moved out of the process, which where I was instructing you, giving you instructions, mm-hmm. and moving into this conversational space. Right. So I think you noted that transition. It's a very important transition to be aware of. Right. Um, so. I think they're all related for sure. They are absolutely really. They're, they're they're very entwined, they're, and and they're almost like folded, like a protein. Yes. Uh, I uh, think that I I, I want to say one thing though. I don't want to, I think there, there could be a reflex to denigrate the mental because yes. we're so uh, suffused with the deficient mental, what Gebs are called the deficient mental. But part of what I think the advanced mental, for lack of a better term, could do is it could become much more complex than a mere 3D grid. Right. Cartesian is really 1.0. It's like mental 1.0, but the more let's, you know, evolutionary mental or whatever you want to call it has m- many, many dimensions that it could use to map space and that it does use. Uh, for example, you mentioned integral theory. I was just looking at uh, Meta Integral's website. I got a promotional email from them yesterday, not promotional, invitational type of email to some coursework and seminars that, that they're doing. And it's meta, 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 but it's all of these very multidimensional, intricate, and almost floridly beautiful kind of um, patternings, uh, spa- patternings for understanding aspects of what at one level or another is a kind of space. So the spaces of, space of, of different states, the space of... Um, different bands or developmental levels, if, in, in, if you use that language, in the um, complexity of consciousness. So there's, uh, you know, meta, meta dynamics, pattern dynamics, psychological types. I mean, there, there's a, um, 
a very complex and intricate and elegant, I would say, from the, the look and feel of it. Uh, I think very elucidated and elaborated mental way of describing, relating to, articulating, and um, transmitting an, an experience of space. But I don't think that's what the a perspectival is. I think the a perspectival has to do with motion and it has to do with the intensities that Gabeser ascribed to the dimension of time. Because in time, we move through all those different spaces and the movement through spaces, the movement between spaces, the space between spaces, uh, you could say, and the, uh, the energy flows, the attentional flows is a temporal phenomenon. It's a temporal unfolding and temporal display. And that, I think that, the, I think that there's a distinction, an important distinction between the multi-perspectival and the aperspectival. And the multi-perspectival is what integral theory describes very well. It's multi-multi-perspectival. So perspectives upon perspectives and elaborated um, elegantly, I think, uh, as I've seen it evolving uh, and uh, transcending and including. Uh, but then the, the aperspectival to me is the fluidity. That is to say, the capacity or ability to move between perspectives and spaces and to have a, again, for lack of a better term, an, in, an intuitive uh, awareness of what space is doing. And the only thing I could add to that is an action plan. <laughs> I believe that's the, that for me is what's missing. Mm-hmm. I, and it, it could just be as simple as going outside and having a beer with a buddy, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, you know, those, those mustard seeds of faith, as Jesus said, mm -hmm. can move mountains. Um, and that's what I found missing from my personal experience of integral theory. Mm -hmm. um, was that it, it wasn't assisting people at dealing with an emerging, emerging knowing action plan. Because we're no longer becoming what we were becoming in this network culture. If you're in a fixed, stable grid, it's pretty easy to predict and control. Or mm -hmm. fairly, not that easy, but you can make some effort at that. But that's a very different world than we're living in now. Mm -hmm. So I really resonated with what you were saying about um, time and Gebser's take on time. And I jotted something down. I, I mentioned in, in clean space, we explore time, space, contexts in an embodied way. I believe we demonstrated that today. Mm -hmm. And I hope to make transparent and diaphanous, I'm borrowing from Gebser here, what happens when time, space, and body-mind interrelate, feelings, sensing, conceiving, perceiving, as flow, mm -hmm. released from the grid, new living arrangements mm -hmm. are possible. So I'm trying to put this, my experience of using clean space and clean language and the, and the people I've been privileged to work with, such as yourself and others, I'm, I believe this is uh, accelerating my own process. And hopefully mm -hmm. I'm a little bit more uh, meta-skilled. Mm -hmm. um, because as we, as we talked in many of our forums, we can go meta, 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 meta. We can go mm -hmm. as meta as we want to. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I think that becomes part of the deficient mental image. Mm -hmm. Unless we can come to embody it you know, and ground it mm -hmm. in some sort of action that then can amplify it mm -hmm. by that inside understanding and then uh, give us a system where there's feedback and feed, mm -hmm. and feed forward. We can, we can track it once we've grounded and amplified it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it just becomes another eureka that gets lost or another synchronicity that we, that we didn't do anything with. Mm -hmm. So that's why I believe um, that for me is what the next step is. Well, let, let, let me ask you about that then. When you say action plan, uh, I, hear, I, I, I hear that on different registers. One register is a to-do list, for example. That's the... I think that's in a grid. You need a to-do list if you're in the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have plenty of to-do lists. I have so to-do lists upon to-do lists. They usually uh, end up at the bottom of my laundry bag. 
<laughs> I find them in the wash. <laughs> and but there are other, I, I think, uh, registers uh, within which we could hear a, the, a term like an action plan, and and part of that I think connects to what you asked me at the beginning of our of our dialogue or of the exercise relating to an outcome. So we have an action plan in relate in relation to an outcome. Another word that people sometimes use is strategy. Uh, strategy relates to action plan. The action plan should be in service of a strategy, which is in service of an outcome, right? So what is the desired outcome on the meta, 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 meta level? That, that to me is an, is an interesting question. I, I, it's one that's emergent for me as well, because there are numerous stories around what our outcomes should be or what they have been in the past, what they might be in the future, who the we even is. When you really start peeling away at what we're really saying or what we think we're saying. There's also a very anti-teleological stress in our uh, postmodern worlds where you're not supposed to have desired outcomes. You should get rid of all that because any desired outcome will just fit into some nefarious power structure. And, and I think that's and the your dark side outcomes of are impossible anyway, uh, because of that self same power structure, which really doesn't allow for, or at least creates the impression that it does not. I, let me make it clear. I think that's bullshit. I really do. I think that feeds into a, a very strong nihilistic streak in our culture, which you know I don't endorse, and I've done my best to disentangle myself from because I want to uh, review that desired outcome as a, a seed we're planting, a possibility, an adjacent possibility. There's no guarantee it will happen, but you do need to have one in order for the system to start to reorganize. Otherwise, you're just going to be drifting. It's just mm -hmm. actual drift forever, mm -hmm. which a lot of postmodernists are quite happy about having more than one beer and sitting, mm -hmm. <laughs> sitting in a dark corner in some dark cafe and having another beer and another beer. So I'm just saying it's so easy to get caught up in that. Um, but because our culture endorses it in so many ways, just, get, just to get lost in, into shopping or addictions or whatever, to distract yourself from uh, perhaps attending to a desired outcome. But you're not supposed to have one, so you better just drop it. Because I think that creates mm -hmm. a lot of tension in, in the system as we move from a, a grid to a, a network society uh, mm -hmm. where there are multiple players, multiple platforms. Right. many different kinds of environments with multiple desired outcomes, it takes a great deal more uh, imagine, healthy imagination, I think, to pull, that, pull that, those possibilities off, as we're right. trying to do here at, at Cosmos Track. Right. Um, well, the, the desired outcomes are there, right? But they're not articulated and they're not elicited. That's right. They're not, I'm just saying we should. We should articulate them. I think so it would be a benefit to do that. I, I would like to then ask what scales we're talking about because... Multiple right? scales. Yeah, um, and part, part of uh, being able to work together, right? Part, part of being able to move toward our desired outcomes is to identify where those places are, where are the, where are the, where are the shared scales that, we, that, are, you know, that are activated between us, right? Mm -hmm. And are we talking about global civilization? Are we talking about interplanetary, you know, astral planes? Are we talking about our, just our personal lives, right? All of those are... I have a hard time separating any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's happening all, yeah, I know. It's a, it is a challenge. Mm. But I think there are motifs. Um, and the whole recycle goes through the parts. So it repeats itself through those parts. And I think we know that as we you know, have those synchronistic events. We open a page of a book in a bookstore where a book fell off the shelf and we open it up and say, oh, there's that eureka thing I've been looking for. Or you listen to a piece of music and you drift off to another place in your life where something could be applied in a, in a useful and creative way. So we're getting these kinds of uh, reports or communiques from the field in many different ways. But if, we, if, if there's no center there from which a person has asked, or stated in clear intention. There's no way for the field to uh, communicate. So this is what I'm offering, is a, a sensitivity to the field, the facts, is invited as we center state and outcome, especially if we do it in a public space. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, uh, and that we can all have multiple desired outcomes and mm -hmm. respectfully 
mm-hmm. uh, interact with this field of all possibilities mm-hmm. in fruitful ways than I believe we have been. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking about us, you and me particularly, in, in, right. in the Cosmo Journal, because I think it's been a beautiful uh, unfolding and infolding that's right. happening here. And I just want to nurture, nurture that as much as I can. Um, we've, we've talked and, so, and sponsor that. We, we've talked about metaphors. I, I wonder what metaphors uh, like arise when you know as we are feeling out the different scales, the different the sort of fractal unfolding of desired outcomes between you know the personal, the social group the planetary, the interplanetary astral. Like I, um, I think part of, you know, part, part of our speech, including in the space in general, has been to touch on and to sort of come from all those different dimensions and to develop a certain way in, in, in each of those, a certain clarity in each of those. Uh, however, on the whole, it's sort of a bubbling uh, inchoate uh, type of milieu. Uh, it, it hasn't yet def- clearly defined a comprehensive action plan. Uh, Absolutely. I agree. And each of us is responsible for coming up with our own version of what's most applicable in our own particular environments. I think that's what's challenging because we're online. Um, we don't, we're not in um, a shared, uh, we're sharing a reality, but it's a different kind of reality hanging out with a beer under mm-hmm. the shade of a tree. I mean, yeah. where we have a real a real time we're sharing together. And I don't need to tell you what's up and what's down, what's left, what's right. We both know. It's assumed. Because, uh, you know, we're, we're members of the same species and we speak English. We can figure that all out. A lot of it can be unsaid. And then a lot of it should never be said. <laughs> but there's a lot that's, that hasn't been said that needs to be said. And I believe that's where, uh, why I've been so attracted to the, the journal and what I think many of the participants are trying to, to explore, that the unsayable. How are we going to put that in words? And if, as many of us make the effort to put that, you know, perhaps translinguistic or even pre-linguistic, but putting it into words, because I think it is a combination of um, the pre-verbal and the transverbal. I think we're going to come up with some uh, new language games that may be much more interesting and what we've uh, inherited. Not that all that we've inherited is unuseful. Most of it, much of it is quite beautiful. But I'm just saying we have the unique opportunities and I hope we can make the most of them. And I think we're, there are demands placed on us to uh, actually, um, for me at any, at any rate, I don't, I, I must protect my solitude. That's very, very important for me to do any of this work at all. Except I also realize the whole uh, privacy, public, um, divide or what has been a divide is very fuzzy mm-hmm. it always has been fuzzy for me mm. uh, but it's getting fuzzier every day mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. i think that's part of the challenge of, of how to protect one's solitude how to stay how to maintain a, a clean space yes and how to facilitate a cleaner language these mm-hmm. are ideals perhaps mm-hmm. that reflect that uh, intention mm-hmm. and, and sponsoring one another in that uh, those possibilities it's not easy, but I think it's very, it can be very delightful and surprising as, we, as these uh, possibilities start to emerge. If we ask, I think, those, those right questions at the right time, or the right cluster of questions at the right time. So. I, I, I would like to throw out some possibilities. Sure. And they're, they're not comprehensive, they're not action plans <laughs> so we're brainstorming that, that's cool so, sort of but not only because they also have to me anyway a quasi visionary qual- quality uh-huh. and the, the vision um, phases say like between clearer less clear higher def- higher definition fuzzier uh, but part of what I would like to see part of what I would like to have happen to have arise would be to have spaces and places where we could go and where we could 
research, develop, unfold, practice, create, code, write, hang out, have a beer, meditate, do things that people do, right? People have always done. I prefer a cup of coffee to a beer. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What I'm most drawn to is research and code and write. Hmm. That's re- and lots of coffee. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, 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 I, wouldn't, uh, I would certainly join you uh, there. But the point being that it's multidimensional. And, like, and even that, I mean, coffee versus beer versus marijuana versus mu- – they all – versus fasting uh, or – or meditation or trance. I'm all for med- I'm all for trance states. I'm, I'm, I think you may have. There were some trancey qualities. I believe in clean space exercise. That oh it. sure, it yeah. was. I, I I let myself become entranced, and even yes. space has its own trance-like quality, right? When when I'm reading a book in that space back there, I become entranced with the book. When I'm speaking with somebody, like I'm speaking with you we can develop a sort of trance space between us. Absolutely. And so when I, so, uh, but, but it is difficult because there, there's this screen here, right? There, uh, yeah. there, there, we're not actually, we're not in a, we're not in the same physical space. We're, we're in a, a non-local virtual space, really. I mean, you know, there, there, there's media between us, yeah. media trend that's allowing us to experience each other. And I haven't figured that out yet. I mean, if I were in the same room with you and we were conducting this clean space exercise, I could have very easily, there, there, there. What do you know from there? What do you know from there? Is there anything else you know from there? And it would have been easy to facilitate. Mm. Uh, and this wasn't difficult to facilitate because you're, you are, for me, a very easy person to work with. And you, because you're very facile with your own experience and mm. you can articulate it pretty well. Mm. So, uh, but that wouldn't be for, true for everybody. Mm-hmm. So it's a, I, I'm glad that you and I had this chance to work together because I, I really enjoy working with people who are moving, who make these transitions mm-hmm. and you know, who are from you know, the grid to something else. And we're just mm-hmm. using grid network as two metaphors we could pick out. I'm sure there are others. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, um, I'm not that interested in working with people who like the grid and want to be better at staying in the grid. And there are lots of people who are very attracted to the grid mm-hmm. and they, you know, and we have to bow down and honor that and also create uh, conditions for something else to happen. Mm-hmm. So that's my, uh, my, my personal challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm, I want to tell you one little story. This is a, this is a, a dream vision that I had. And um, I, because the, it just came to me recently. Something like in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, I was involved in. Um, I was taking this group therapy thing. She was a she was a union therapist. She was also channeling um, an entity. You know, mm-hmm. this is like right in the beginning of the new age. And um, I remember having a very vivid uh, experience of I in a dream state. It was a lucid dream, one of the first lucid dreams that I think I had. Um, I just saw all these people in chains going down a street. And I said, do you want to live like slaves? And I started to run. And I ran to this meadow. And there was a little hill and there was a beam of light. And I knew that if I got to that beam of light, I would be vaporized, <laughs> which I was all for, because I wanted to beam me up <laughs> you know, from this master slave world. And when I got to the beam of light, all of a sudden in a panoramic shower of arrows, and javelins pierced my dream body. So I looked down at my body and I was like a pin cushion right out of St. Sebastian, right? And I went, but where, you know, I wanted to get beamed up. I wanted to die, actually. I want to vanish from this, this slave master dynamic. That was my intention. But I wasn't dead. And I hadn't been vaporized. And I heard a voice, it was a male voice, and it was above my head, my dream head. And it said, now go back and make a living arrangement. A living arrangement. A living arrangement. Now, that's a very curious thing for me. 
because it didn't it didn't specify how in the world I was supposed to do that. <clears throat> I had to come up with my own action plans, um, but I had that, and I didn't argue. It seemed to me something that this voice above my head wanted, but it's also something that I wanted. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm talking about like that fractal nature, how the whole um, reiterates or repeats itself through the part. And that, uh, that I think is a very compelling, compelling experience for me. And I look back at it 30, 40 years later, and uh, along with all that new agey stuff that was happening, some of it was very creative, but I think the new age did fail in what it set out to do. But I think in a fractal-like way, we're reiterating a lot of what was happening in the new age. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we'll be able to you know, create the conditions for something that was better, at least than that was. Uh, and I think that, that Wilbur's work and our work and studying Gebster and Schlauterdijk, I believe this is creating the, you know, the possibility, laying down a foundation for this, uh, whatever you want to call it, the interval, the apperspectival, or this new emergent age. Mm-hmm. So anyway, these are my intuitions uh, because I believe each of us are having these visionary episodes in our own ways if we're paying attention to it. But how can we cultivate it in a way, in a group kind of way, mm-hmm. where and rather than one person coming up with a vision and everyone else scrambling to implement it, how can each of us be our own visionary, yeah. have our own metaphors and bring that in a way that's complementary to other people's visions and metaphors? Um, and I'm not saying we always need visionaries. We may not need visionaries if everything's going. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know. Yeah. But if it is broke, you need visionaries around. Yeah. And hopefully who, who can experience a discipline flow with yeah. others. And that's not always the case. Some visionaries are actually pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's my two cents. Well, um, the living arrangements. Uh, I th- I think that has something to do, to do with Sloterdijk. And I think part of what, if, if he's articulating ultimately a philosophy, it's, a, I would t- say, at this early stage, we're just, you know, not quite through the first of three books of the trilogy. Right. But as far as I can discern the arc of, of his thought, part of what I think he's attempting to articulate or elucidate is a sense of living arrangements, is a sense of how we can cultivate or how we could um, umwelt you know oh yeah we have umwelt we also have an einenwelt an inner world that corresponds to the that outer world indeed and i, I think part of the diagnosis insofar as he's a cu- cultural physician in the li- tradition of nietzsche and and uh, um you know others who are looking at large you know how phenomena are unfolding and how much it, how fucked up it is <laughs> and so he he's i think partly taking us through a tour of scales, right? So we're starting from the s- most intimate, smallest, most subtle scales, the, inf- the fetus in, in a womb, barely able to, you know, barely perceptive of the differentiation between self, other, inside, outside. From that scale, which uh, for all intents and purposes is primordial to, to, to us as, as human incarnated beings, all of, to the global, to the, the globe and then the foam there's i think something in, mm, um to me i find it nourishing i find it clarifying uh, i know that it's obscure in various ways i know that it's mistaken in various ways but to 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 take that tour and to go through the the arc of of spaces from intimacy to the you know to the postmodern foam part of what i think it could entrain us to do or could help us prepare to do is to find how we build those living arrangements at those different scales and how they can especially when we're no longer becoming what we were becoming it can get very tricky well we had there was a certain ideal from the grid there was a certain grid ideal you know that we would be becoming this global liberal democracy uh, of, you know, individuals, uh, consumers, and, uh, you know, living in prosperous societies of economic growth forever. <laughs> and, well, but that also perpetuated a lot of the master-slave dynamics. That was the, the shadow side, which modernity has not dealt with. 
and probably it isn't going to. <laughs> so we have to sort of, I think, create conditions where perhaps those subpersonalities can come forward and we can label and we can bless these different uh, aspects of our nature, mm. which have been shelved or swept you know, under the rug, you know, the, the parapsychological, the synchronicities, all the anomalies that happen that don't fit in the grid world have, can no longer be, I, I believe, pathologized so easily mm. in this network society that is emerging. So for that, in general, we need space. And I think we also need spaces. Uh, and part of what we have here is a virtual space where electrons are connecting us uh, across wires and trans, you know, satellite transmissions. Uh, I think we also need physical spaces. We need full, yes. you know, the full spaces uh, for lack of a, this is all changing, of course, right? We're going to be in physical spaces with augmented reality. We're going to have implants. I mean, this is all changing pretty quickly. Uh, so the terms are a bit slippery, but yes, I mean, like having a place, let's just say a, with walls, perhaps with a garden, maybe. Like a uh, conference space with a garden or whatever, where people were in real time together. I, I, I would so, like to see to be concrete, a network of locations across the world where we can go, we, the larger we, a sort of network of we's, and hang out and research and practice and work on things, work on our action plans. Uh-huh. And perform. And perform. You know. Yeah, all of it. Start up, write, mm-hmm. recite right. poetry, all that stuff. All of it, right. All that 19th century stuff. I think we want to reclaim some of that. Those Flotation salons. tanks, hot tub, what, you know, but <laughs> I, that, I agree, I agree. Uh, and I, I know that those places exist, but they tend to be isolated and they tend not to be actually networked with each other and they tend to be siloed and they're part of the grid, actually. They're, okay. they're kind of actually in the grid. They're on the grid, so to yeah, speak. So you can recharge your battery so you can go, go back and be a better warrior than you've ever been before. I mean, to me, that's a waste of time. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm, inter- I'm all for retreats. And I'm all for um, creating spaces where people's, uh, you know, where you can protect um, whatever's happening there. But I just don't want it to be, you know, I, I, I would like these kind of exchanges we're having and that we have had with other of our colleagues um, I think it's great what we've been doing, and we could supplement it with those more face-to-face in the same space, in the same environment. And we could, if we could record that, we would get the best of all possible worlds, I think, because it would be where that private, public, of course, there are always going to be private conversations that people are going to require, but I'm just, I'm just interested in that interplay between the public and the private and how we can you know, create more vibrant networks. That's my, my, I think my desired outcome in a nutshell. Yeah. I think those networks are very important. I mean, I think those networks are the future. Right. We agree there. I think we have many beliefs probably that are very useful beliefs. Um, and we probably share with others useful beliefs. We probably haven't articulated them or made them clear, but I think that is one. Mm. I that I think we both share and many others do as well. And also what you said about moving towards our desired outcome. I think that's a pattern, a meta pattern, which is very different from moving away from what you don't want. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is often what the critic does well, is move away from something they don't like. And I think the visionary tends to move towards that. And it's usually very future oriented. So I believe, you know, we need critics as we talked about in our last uh, Slaughter Dyke discussion, we were talking about critics and uh, dreamer, visionary, um, the realist. Mm-hmm. So I think those functions are, are very extremely important to coordinate and to, to uh, bless. I mean, the critic is very necessary um, to any healthy organization or any healthy person. Because mm. uh, I think the, the visionary left to its own devices can incredibly grandiose, ungrounded, so it needs the realism. Yeah. So I think Mm -hmm. that's part of the 
hopefully we can sponsor. Um, we can recognize that we do have, we have beliefs that are useful. We also have limiting beliefs. So I think we need to pull up the weeds and we need to plant seeds. I think the problem is, and I think this is in a, in a conversation that I heard with you and Ed, uh, where he was very down on the postmodern. Um, and I think Houston Smith said it really well that the, the postmodernists were really pulling up weeds, but they forgot to plant anything. <laughs> and I think that's, and I think that some of the weeds they pulled up were good that we got rid of, or at least exposed, uh, because, uh, you know, slavery and racism and sexism and homophobia and uh, the, the failure to appreciate the environment. I think those are good things that, you know, were, were brought to the, to the to the table by the postmodern is you know for all of its excesses i think it was great that they sort of dismantled a lot of that that power mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that that master slave kind of mm -hmm. dynamic. but i think we're all much more sophisticated thinkers than we would have been if we had not gone through that so mm -hmm. uh, but that's another conversation i was listening to between you and ed and it was very stimulating to me i really enjoyed the conversation because i could oh yeah we're we, we do have a belief system um, that we share. And I think we may have a different emphasis and we may have arrived at that in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, um, you know, we can, we can do exercises like the ones we do today. I believe that could, uh, you know, bring out that tacit knowledge, that background stuff. Yeah. Bring attention to it. Yes. And I think that actually and then find those action plans that can amplify that. Yes. So that's my expectation, actually. That would happen if we create the right conditions. Yes, I, I, I agree. You, I, you, we, we believe, we, I think we do. Yes, I, I think that conditions are um, often overlooked. Right. We have action plans. Right. We have goals, strategies, objectives and to-do lists, uh, but we haven't created the conditions for any of that to be successful. Right, right. And, and once we have a desired outcome, and it's well stated, once we have that center and we can uh, pay attention to our intention, hmm. we can open to the field and we can then receive feedback because then we have some guidance system that we're like able to steer our way through all these different um, multiple agendas, which mm -hmm. may not be something that we're interested in. So we can find out well, what's relevant, what's important. Let's create another model. Let's streamline it. Let's toss that out. And we're creating those conditions. So um, I believe that that's extremely important because we can't, we cannot, we're, transformation is not something that we can do. You know, mm -hmm. I can't transform the system, neither can you. But we can, I think, create conditions for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's what the, the members of our species that I respect the most have done so yes. <laughs> at, great, at great peril sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's possible, desirable, and I think it has been done. Mm. So that's what fascinates me too about that fractal-like nature of uh, how motifs and patterns and beliefs, uh, how throughout history there have been always people at the edge who were maybe discontented or unhappy or had some tragic episode or whatever, but they were at odds. And um, so they, you know, formed relationships and they planted these seeds. And no one in their right mind would say, this is possible. I was a, a gay person and I was, I was 10 years old. I went to the library and I looked at homosexuality. And I read Freud, I read all the psychotherapists, the sociologists, and they all were in agreement that, I was doomed to prostitution and drugs and alcohol <laughs> and homosexuals cannot love. That was the norm. That was the norm. And I just, at 10 years old, I read all this shit. I said, they can't be right. Mm -hmm. And now we can look back on that. And I think I wasn't the only one who was, that was vibrating, that rejection of this kind of label, uh, label and dismiss people like myself, but it wasn't easy and it wasn't free of risk. Mm -hmm. And I paid a very high price in some areas of my life. But now I look back on it and I said, I'm glad that I did, but it wasn't a guaranteed thing. Mm -hmm. But I had to reach out to others. Others reached out to me. We created conditions where, you know, different kinds of voices could be heard. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, 
the system has reorganized around those efforts. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, we're not finished yet, but I think there's much, and I'm not into identity politics, mm -hmm. um, but I think that, I think there's a lot of things that uh, we learned back then that have, that need to come back. We need to re reiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is very fractalized. I think there are a lot of ex excesses and mistakes that we made. We can learn from those too. But I think we need to start, or at least this may be my challenge. I don't want to confuse my desired outcome or, 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 the, or the task that I need to perform with the, the group's task. Because mm -hmm. I think we all have, we have different tasks. We have different relationships. Finding a balance between the tasks and the relationships is an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just sharing this with you. And um, I find this a very compelling space that, we've, uh, that we're sharing today. And mm. I've had a great time. So yes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to what happens next. And I'm going to be, I've taken a lot of notes here mm -hmm. and I can reflect upon this process and I hope you will as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, maybe not too distant future. I hear your train. Yes. <laughs> I hear your train. I will. Uh, in the not too distant future, we can, you know, pull our resources and yeah. maybe there's something that we learn from this that we, you know, it's not concrete right now. But maybe something will will become concrete. Mm -hmm. Can I share a few things before we close then? Please. please. Uh, I'm in an, I have no time constraint or anything, but I just want to let you know. Okay, I, I, I'm I'm okay for a little while as well. Okay. Um, but first, I think that I, I I would I want to ask, but I think I think it's cl uh, clear to me that space is a kind of condition, and that creating a space is creating condition for something to happen in that space. Uh, I, the exercise that we did, I used words, the words grow, grow things. Uh, the idea of growing, the metaphor of, uh, the, the cultivation metaphor, the agricultural metaphor uh, has, has come back and, and it's been in the space more generally. Like Caroline, for example, has talked about it. Uh, it's common uh, as well. I mean, it's so much part of the human experience now. I mean, 10,000 years of agriculture, we know what it means to plant a seed in the ground, water it, and have it grow. We also know what it means to lose uh, food. Part of us knows what it means to starve because uh, the, the, the land was infected by um, weeds or by parasites or what have you. Uh, so we know that the metaphor has deep resonance, right? Um, and, and so I think though, part of what I also see happening is that like the clean space and clean language is that part of, part of it is almost, um, a way of working with the soil, right? If, if that's a condition, if space is a condition, we're sort of over, overlapping metaphors and, and words, but part of it has, is a soil effect and, I, I've spent some time this weekend uh, at, at a farm where we get food uh, locally and talked a lot. They talked a lot about the soil and about how important it is to have healthy soil. Healthy soil is complex, actually. It has structure to it. It has communication networks within it. Uh, it has um, different, uh, it has, uh, it's its own biome. It's its own ecosystem that relates to what's above the soil, to air, the air, the sunshine, etc. But underground, there, there, there's, um, there's a, there are distinct qualities to to that space, and one of the things it, it does is there's a decomposition quality, or a de decompositional dynamic, let's say, so that uh, as things die, as uh, organic matter is cast off, you know, by living things, uh, it is reabsorbed and it actually enriches. The space and i think that part of the what we're doing we don't always know exactly we're always doing multiple things at once but part of what we're doing let's see, between when we put the voices of the visionary the, the realist and the critic in the same space is that we're engendering a, a biodynamic we're engendering a, a biodynamic uh process uh where ideas metaphors language games, what have you, get decomposed 
into constitutive parts, but those parts aren't lost. Those parts can be reabsorbed into the generative matrix or the conditions that allow things to, to grow. And that's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, lin, it's not a grid structure. It's not a grid process. It's uh, not a linear kind of. No. And, and we know, and we know that too. Um, but it, it is, uh, it is a, um, there is a, a way in which it is consuming, right? Because part of you, part of us is being decomposed Absolutely. into constitutive parts that maybe then be taken up into, you know, a newly living matter. And I think that part of the public private is, has to do with that. It has to do with allowing things to work on us, allowing ourselves to work on others. Like there's a way we work quote unquote work on each other and where you were channeling me in your discussion oh, okay. with Ed. You said, Oh, I'm channeling Johnny. And I thought, well, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> I like what you said. So I thought yeah. that's great. So we're having mutual influences. Yes. That are, they're helpful. Yes. I think it's so important. Yes. And to a- allow for that. Absolutely. If the space is healthy and it feels healthy and, and nutritious and that, that we're actually are growing something that's, you know, we're, we're, we're not depleting the soil. We're enriching the soil. We're, we're creating the space, oh, space. conditions. Yes. Uh, like that. Space. Uh, and so I, I like doing this because I feel like it works on me. And I feel that it allows me to work on others. It allows me to work on things, work things out. And I, I hope that, I, I think that we're at an early stage in this whole, whatever this is. Right. And things are going fast and there are forces that are beyond, you know, our re- individual control. Absolutely. Uh, that are, nope. I'm not in control. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> and I sort of released that need to be in control so that I can be, you know, open and curious and undefended. When I can be, sometimes I will, you know, I'll have to, uh, you know, that healthy warrior can come forward too. Mm. But the healthy warrior is always fighting for, for others. Mm. I think that's so important. Um, so as we, uh, you know, create that healthy relationship to the warrior, um, you know, we were going to have differences. And I think we've already, you and the Ed were talking about those differences. Um, I think that's great that we're handling those differences in, in ways um, that are uh, creative and generative mm. is, is I think what I'm not interested in is uh, joining another dysfunctional family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've had a dysfunctional family. I'm not interested in that particular metaphor anymore. Yeah. I feel like I've gone beyond the biological family thing and it, and it wasn't easy. And I've, I've write, I've written about this. And I think that's a very compelling theme for me because mm. I'd like to revisit uh, those kinds of family dramas. And, you know, let's face it, if you go back to the Greeks, Greek tragedy is nothing but one long family drama. Yeah. So these are very compelling. And I do believe that's what Schlutterdijk is sort of um, casting a wide net too. Mm-hmm. So, but I think all, many of us are ready to move on. We haven't mm. really specified what that would be like. Um, but we, and we definitely can... But I think that family dynamic um, has had its day, and it's part of that grid. Uh, and I think the patriarchy is really uh, its last gasp. And Donald Trump, I may be wrong, <laughs> but I think it's really uh, coming Just wait to for it. AI, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been wrong before, and I may be wrong again. But I think you know this is um, the tail end of something. I'm just like rather than get all wrapped up in to that uh, kind of dynamic. I just want to, you know, plant seeds for something else. Um, so, and I'm deep bows to you and to, to Caroline and all of our other colleagues who are, who are making these generous efforts because I think we're going to look back on all of this and uh, say, and, and we're going to be glad yeah. that we made these efforts. I think so, so too. I think we want to create those compelling futures. Um, yeah, I think so I, too. I think the evidence is if you have a compelling future, your present is going to be much more interesting. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I agree. And I, I certainly feel that when I do. 
<laughs> I don't always. I mean, sometimes the dark, dark clouds, yeah. right? And, and it so. takes a lot of discipline um, and a lot of dynamic flow to like acknowledge that. Even those demonic, uh, like I shared in a dream, I think, with you and, and Ed, that uh, I, I came across this very fearful thing. But I found myself able to be open and bless it. And uh, it's energy dissipated. It's negative energy dissipated very quickly. So I think we, we often are confronted with these threshold figures. And if they scare the shit out of you and you, don't, and you can't match them, it's a good thing. Hmm. Because I think that's very, you don't want to go too fast into territories that you're not ready to handle. Yeah. So I've learned how to respect, you know, sometimes, you know, the dragon at the door, you open up the door and the dragon is too fucking big. You better run out the back door. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best, that's the most wise thing you could do. Um, but we have to someday face up to that stuff. And so I think that, you know, we visionaries, I think we've had these experiences in many different contexts. And um, I, I believe for uh, one of my teachers and I, don't, didn't have too many spiritual teachers that I really liked, respected. Some of them are pretty crazy, but one one of them was Richard Moss, and he said something about fear, F-E-A-R, forever evading another reality. And that always stuck with me. When those fear states come up, or those stuck states. Um, it's just evading another reality. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed speaking with you, John. My pleasure. And, and if you come to the city this summer, we'll have to have a beer. I would love to. I am thinking of, I'm not going to be there this summer. I'm pretty sure of that. But I, I am thinking of, I haven't committed to the Gapster Conference, but I'm thinking of visiting. Oh, least. that's in the fall, right? That's in October. Oh, cool. I'll be there too. My, I'll, I'm thinking of just being in the area at least. Maybe, you know, I, I don't have a paper to present or anything. I, I have no real reason to be there other than just to, see people and so uh i would love to see you <laughs> my uh, pleasure. Else is around. and my folks speaking of family dynamics live on long island so uh potentially it's an opportunity to see them they're in their you know they're in their eight elderly years and so i never know when is the last time that that i'll see them so i try to try to take the opportunities to do so when i can and if i could stack purposes and desired outcomes then all the better that's great. That's great. Oh, I may not be there for this uh, Schlatter Dyke this Thursday. Okay. I have some business I have to take care of. Okay. So please give my best to everybody, and I'll be listening to the video when it comes out. Wonderful. All right. Well, until next time. Until next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.